Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. happy to be here. We got one. We got one. I think we got a video. You may be seen it. People ask me why I came to Honduras. I've been here 12 years now in a poor place because first of all, God told me, God, hey, what are you doing? I have a plan for you. I said, okay, let's do it. And so I came down here uh, after my eyes were opened to the people down here. They're so relational. They love the Lord. They're very poor in the sense. They don't have a lot of material things. And it's difficult to live day to day sometimes without water, or they have a leaky roof, or they don't have a floor in their house. Their kids are always dirty and sick. But hey, 
They are rich in resources. They have coffee that is really good. Let's take it and see if we can use it for, for something bigger. It's families that grow it, the families that work together to harvest it each year. And we're able to come in and, and help them uh, with their, their great coffee and spread it to other parts of the world. I just hope through these coffee beans, I am able to share with others, even those I cannot see, that Jesus Christ is the one that changes lives. When, when someone buys coffee from us, what it's doing is it's setting a, a force in place that allows us down here in Honduras and hopefully in other parts of the world eventually to serve people. There's no way we can possibly meet every need uh, that's down in Honduras. But what it does is it, it creates a platform uh, for the local church, uh, people that live here, uh, just a new a foot in the door to be able to just share the good news of Christ and establish a relationship and meet a need where they are. There have been many families blessed in our neighborhood through the completed projects of Hope Park. And these projects demonstrate the grace and love of Jesus Christ. And so we can come in with, with money that, that's been coming in from the coffee buying. We can take that and, and change people's lives in their, in, in their daily life. And then in doing that whole act, the whole relationship takes place. And that's when we say, hey, this is because God loves us and he's given us this and we're, we're sharing it with you. And it's an open door for them. And it's an open door for you to keep drinking it and hopefully share it. And hopefully we can bring Hope Coffee in, in the model to your church and you can share it with people around your world. Welcome to First Missionary this morning. Uh, wow, great looking crew this morning. Why don't you look at your neighbor right now and just say, you look great. You just look great. So glad you're here. You look great. Looks like we got some room today. This past week we kind of narrowed our, our rows up a little bit. We have more seats in here to start a service than we had the last couple weeks. So that's great. Hope you're comfortable. Glad you're here this morning. Just want to remind you, when you come in on a Sunday morning, if you don't care, just when you, if you're the first one in that row, go ahead and kind of scoot toward the center and make room for people on the end because people come in late in the service. And last week, something really blessed my heart. I had some folks who were coming here today, uh, coming here last week. They were brand new, had never been here before. You're thinking, well, I've never been here before until two weeks ago. But anyway, they came in and they were late. And some folks who are just regular people here at First Missionary, saw them looking for a seat and just got up and gave up their seats and said, y'all sit right here. That was so neat, so neat. And I, I've heard horror stories of people going to a new church, a, a new place, and they, they find a seat and then somebody comes up and says, you're in my seat. I hope and pray that never happens here, amen? Well, these seats are here to give away, right? We will get up, we will go to the lobby, we'll go to a classroom, we will watch it there before we uh, make somebody else, you know, feel like they're not welcome or not at home. We're just so glad you're here. And we're going to introduce a, a brand new ministry uh, this morning to First Missionary. We've been kind of uh, getting our legs under us the last couple of weeks, and Jamie here is going to tell us all about this new ministry we're starting today through our cafe. Good morning. Yes, we are very excited to introduce this morning our Hope Cafe ministry featuring Hope Coffee. And as you saw in the video there, it's a, it's a very dynamic ministry that we're very excited to incorporate here at First Missionary. Uh, you know, when we were getting together to discuss what we wanted to feature at this new facility, um, hospitality was very much at the forefront of most of those discussions. And one element that we were very excited about incorporating into our hospitality ministry was the idea of a coffee bar or a coffee cafe. And so that was something that we decided we would just take and run with. And when Alan approached me about being involved in this particular ministry, uh, I was really excited about it because those of you that know me well know that I'm, I'm a big coffee fan. So this was a win-win for me. But uh, he also suggested that I look into the Hope Coffee Ministries. And folks, when I did, that video was one of several that I watched and it just touched me and I just really fell in love with the idea of getting in a partnership with people, uh, a ministry partnership whereby 
we reap benefits and they reap benefits as well. So I uh, just wanted to give you a, a chance to see kind of behind the scenes what this ministry is all about this morning and to just leave you with the, the idea that uh, the donations that you are giving to this particular ministry each and every Sunday morning, uh, yes, they're going somewhat to cover our expenses here locally and to, to be able to, to run the cafe. But more than anything, folks, as you saw, this ministry is touching lives. It, it's a partnership with a ministry that is, is affecting people at the, at the ground level, uh, people who are very much in need, and it, it gives us an opportunity to support them. They support us. We get a delicious cup of coffee out of it in the process, and uh, it, it's just something we're really excited about. So just uh, if you would like to be involved in this particular ministry, please see me. We're looking for some, some additional folks to help staff our cafe. Uh, we're all, we've also been featuring uh, Parcells Donuts in the cafe these first few weeks as well. So just very excited about uh, this new ministry and, and its future and where, where it's going to take us and where we can help people around the world. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Jamie. Um, we've been calling our cafe the Hope Cafe, serving hope with each cup. So every cup of coffee, every dollar that goes into that ministry supports the churches, the ministries, water projects, shelter projects, and local churches in those areas where those coffee beans are actually harvested. Honduras, Mexico, those are the primary places that when you drink a cup of coffee, here at First Missionary, those are the areas that you're impacting with the gospel and with hope. The Hope Cafe, serving hope with each cup. Something else you're going to need today before you leave, uh, you'll find these uh, every other seat. You're welcome to share this uh, with your family, couples. Uh, if you'll just look around, grab one of these this morning, and there's going to be there's just so many opportunities to serve and to minister. In the days to come, we're really expecting uh, God to continue to open really, really neat doors for ministry. And guess what? To serve those ministry needs, it takes all of us. It takes every single one of us locking arms, serving together. Uh, just in fact, today, we've had to make some changes with our preschool ministry. Uh, our opening Sunday here, we had 11 babies in the nursery. 11 babies in the nursery. One, one is enough for me. Amen? I mean, but 11 babies in the nursery. I think we had eight last week. So we had to make some changes in the, the ages that we can minister to during the preschool time of the service. You say, Brother Allen, why are you telling me that? I'm telling you that because if we had more people willing to serve, we can expand that ministry and, and minister to even more kids during the service. But we we, we can only do with what we have. Amen. We can only do with what we have. So there's opportunity for you. There is a need for you to serve right now. It is near and dear to our hearts to take care of our kids here at First Missionary. Put a huge emphasis and priority on ministering to them because they are our what? They are our what? They are our future. They're our future. They're our future, but not just our future. They're our present. Amen. They are our present. So step out there, uh, look at the nursery, look at the preschool areas first. There's other areas to serve. I need everyone to take one of these and say, I want to be a part of what God's doing. I want to be a part of what God's doing. My life has meaning. My life has purpose. I'm not here by accident. He's got a plan for me to share and to bless with others how he's blessed me. So on your card today, look over that, pray over that. And when the offering comes along later in the service, you check the area of ministry you'd love to serve in. Place it in there if one of our ministry leaders would be in touch with you about plugging you in to ministry. So excited. So I'm so excited to be here today. So excited you're here today. Let's stand. Let's pray together. Then we're going to go right into worship and continue this morning with worship. Please check out your bulletin, all the other announcements. Thank you for your patience. We're still trying to get into the building. We're still working kinks out. And please remember, when you come into the service, scoot toward the middle, make room on the ends for people who come late. Let's pray and continue to worship this morning. Father God, thank you so much for your goodness and your grace unto us. And Father, today we're going to hear again and again and again, to whom much is given, much is required. To whom much is given, 
much is to flow out. To whom is blessed much? The opportunity to bless others comes. So Father, we thank you for Jesus. We start with a thankful, thankful heart for him, all he's blessed us with, and most importantly, Father, thank you for the gospel, for salvation, for hope, and Father, we thank you for the people sitting next to us right now. We give you our hearts to worship, and we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. drink from always my soul let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide the ransom for my life always my soul for you, you are, are good good oh you are good good
I was was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah! Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah! Christ is risen from the grave. Call me out of all 
dressing, I'm dressed. I'm dressed in your royalty. And your Holy Spirit lives in me. I see my past is buried deep. The in freedom because you've made us new creatures we're no longer bound by sin and darkness and death but we're slaves to righteousness this morning thank you that the only thing left for us to do is to rest and enjoy Jesus we are honored to be here today we're honored to be in Christ seated at the right hand in heavenly places Join in the song that stretches from eternity to eternity. You're so, so good this morning. Despite the mess that we bring with us, God, and whatever might be going on today, you have defeated death. And you're worthy of all praise and honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we sing today. Amen. We have our ushers begin in the back.
Well, if you didn't turn your card in this morning as the offering was placed, you can still fill that out and turn that into the Vista Information Desk on your way out this morning. We'd love to be able to plug you into ministry so we can just keep on going. Uh, we'll be going to Luke chapter 12 in just a second to kind of give you a heads up of where we're going this morning. Luke chapter 12. You know, several years ago, um, when I was a youth pastor in, in Texas, it was probably about the summer of 1996, and I took our, our students to a water park in central Texas. If you're taking notes today, you can write down the term Schlitterbahn. That's where I was taking the students. So what in the world does the word Schlitterbahn mean? It is actually a German word that means waterway. It was in this little German uh, settlement in central Texas. So you're thinking, Germans in Texas, yes, it happened. And yes, there was a water park there that was called Schlitterbahn. It means waterway. We were taking a group of students there, and uh, we stopped at a convenience store probably about five miles away from the water park, which is named Schlitterbahn. And so anyway, we were at the convenience store, and I'm gathering all the kids up in the church van at that time. And, and I have a love-hate relationship with church vans, I'm just saying. A lot of interesting experiences have happened in my life when I was driving or a part of a church van. I think they're really uh, possessed, just in my opinion. No, they're saying, no, you're only possessed when you're driving it. But anyway, we were probably about five miles out from Schlitterbahn, and I was getting all the kids together. We're at a convenience store. We load up, and I know I've told this story before, but we, we head down the road, and then at that moment, it dawns on me, I need to make sure I have all my students, right? Uh, yeah, I'm miles down the road, and I'm thinking at this point in time, I'll, it'd probably be a good idea to make sure I have all my students. And so I'm looking in the little rearview mirror there, and I'm calling out names, and there's this one kid who was always a practical jokester, and somebody says, hey, so-and-so is not here. And I'm just, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he, he's back there and he's lying in the seat, you know, or whatever. He's playing a practical joke. So I start calling his name. You know, he doesn't come up. I call his name. He doesn't come up. So I just start calling all of his buddies' names. Okay, where's, okay, tell him to get up, all right? I'm driving down the road. And then finally, one of the students said, we're not kidding. He's not here. I said, what do you mean he's not here? You left him behind at the convenience store. So I turned the bus around. We go back. All of that to say is it's easy when you are going full steam ahead. You're trying to get to your destination. And along the way, you look up in the rear view mirror and you realize you've left someone behind. You know, over the last three weeks, we have been in a tremendous, tremendous transition. Uh, we have felt like we have been in a whirlwind in the middle of it. And I don't know what all that whirlwind is doing, but I know a lot of changes are taking place. And guess what? As we've been in this transition phase, life has not stopped for any of us. Can I get an amen? Life has not stopped for any of us. And the one thing that I would hate for us to do is to become so caught up in where we're going, that we get to a place and we look behind and we say, hey, where is so-and-so? Where's this family? Where's that family? Their life is going. They might be challenged and having difficulties. They might want to be here this morning. They might not even know if there's going to be a seat here for them. So think about today, people around you, as you look around and welcome new people, think, okay, who am I missing? How can I reach out to them and let them know that we do not want to leave them behind? Because after all, this is really a new beginning or a new chapter for us, but a fresh start for someone else. A new chapter, a new beginning for us but a fresh start for someone else. In fact, we had a family to contact us after the first service, and they said that fresh start is us. That's where we are today. We're here because we need a fresh start 
in our life, in our family. Many times we come to life, we're faced with all kinds of things. Some things we're just trying to manage and maintain and hold on to. Sometimes we're trying to keep old things going that we really just need to let go. Can you think of a time in your life where you just really needed a fresh start? That you needed to kind of walk away from some things? You needed to let go of some things? Maybe there's some things that you're bringing with you today. And boy, I tell you what, that first Sunday, I went to the old building, I went to the altar, and I said, Lord, a lot of stuff has happened in my life in almost 20 years of ministry. So many blessings, so many joyous experiences, but there's also been years of challenge. And God, I just want to come to this place right now this morning, and Father, I am leaving behind what I need to leave behind. And God reminded me of something. I shared this with you last week, that if you are needing a fresh start in your life, that there's going to be a, a several things that might need to happen for you, but one thing that m might certainly need to happen for you is in spite of your past, recognizing the past is behind you and putting the past behind you, you come to a place where you recognize and you accept God's forgiveness of you in your life. That you accept God's forgiveness. That His forgiveness, of, however you got here, whatever you did, no matter what the past looks like, I think it will be hard for you to move forward if you haven't accepted God's forgiveness in your life. Remember, forgiveness is setting a captive free and realizing you're the captive. You accept God's forgiveness. Uh, just recently in my life, man, something came across me and I thought, you know, Lord, I do not think I handled that in the right way. I need to try to fix that. I need to try to correct that God. Oh, it just began to trouble me. And I just came to the Lord and I just admitted that to him. I said, God, you know, I blew it in that moment. I would love to have a do-over, God. But guess what? In life, in those situations, you don't get do-overs like that, right? And so I just said, God, I just confess that to you. I acknowledge that to you. And then the Spirit of God began to come over me. His Spirit spoke fresh into my life and said, Alan... I've already got it covered. I've already got it covered. What you did in coming to me and acknowledging that and owning that, that was for you. That was your side. But on my side, I've already taken care of that. You can walk free. And that was a really, really key moment for me just to breathe fresh in and acknowledge again that I am a card-carrying member of the Forgiven Club and there's no expiration on that day. But then, you've got to apply the same forgiveness that's come to you to someone else. Is there someone you need to forgive that, that you need to say, you know, God, I can't change what happened. Uh, me forgiving them does not make it right. You know, God, uh, I, I trust you with it, Father. You know, put aside all those things, all those connotations that you have when it comes to forgiving someone, you're not undoing it, you're not changing it, you're not making any declaration of judgment, you're just simply saying, God, I will let you deal with that, but God, I need to forgive. I need to forgive so-and-so, I release them, they don't have to apologize to me. In fact, this person you need to forgive today might be someone who's deceased, a loved one, a parent, whoever in your life, you will, you on this side of heaven may never have the chance to tell them personally, I forgive you. But you need to do that anyway because after all, forgiveness is setting the captive free and realizing that you're the captive. Not changing it. Not undoing it. But accepting to live with the consequences of what somebody else might have said or done to you and you know what I've concluded too, folks? I've concluded that many times where there's offenses, there, it's more about misunderstandings. Because I really believe at the end of the day, at the end of the day, and if you ever lose this hope, you're done. At the end of the day, people who are in Christ, they really want to do what is right. 
And so many times these issues are really more about misunderstandings. And sometimes what happens is someone sees something that they think is wrong. They want to jump in and serve justice. And then in serving justice, they might hurt somebody or harm somebody, say something bad against them, act a certain way. And they think that they're serving justice in that moment, but they think they're doing the right thing, although what they're doing is harmful. And it might have hurt you in your life. But you still need to forgive. Apply what's been given to you and let God know they don't owe you anything anymore. Let it go. Forgive. Control alt delete. A do over. A fresh do. We all need change, and fresh starts in our life. Control-Alt-Delete. A do-over. You ever played a game with a kid? And the game didn't start out so good, and the kid said, what? I want a what? I want a do-over. Or maybe you looked in the mirror mo one morning, and you said, I need a fresh do. Why don't you look at your neighbor right now and say, I think you need a fresh do. I really do. I really do. I think you need. I'm just kidding. Just get, you need a fresh day. I know some of you are going, uh, I, they ain't got much doing to do with right there, okay? Fresh day. Control, alt, delete, a do over, a fresh do. I'm convinced that God is about making things new. All throughout Scripture, we see that God makes things new. We see that in Scripture, He gives to us in Christ a new covenant. New covenant. Not the old made over, but a brand new way in which He deals with people on the basis of grace. He's into the new. New covenant. He also says in His Word that anyone who is in Christ is a new what? Anyone who is in Christ is a new what? Anyone who is in Christ is a new what? A new creation. In the apocalyptic Jesus, in the book of Revelation, Revelation 21.5, Jesus says, I am making all things what? I am making all things new. God is really in to do-overs, fresh starts, and new do's. And maybe today, the new do is you. What he wants to do fresh in your life today. As I look around the room today, I'm even reminded that God's preparing you. He's preparing you for the new that he's getting ready to do in your life. Years ago, a mentor of mine said something. I don't want to use the word haunt because that sounds scary. But a mentor of mine, a former pastor, said something to me years ago. That's haunted me. In a good way. It's the same words of Jesus. And it's in Luke 12. At the end of verse 48. It's the same words of Jesus. That have been coming back to me this week. In regards to us. I'll never forget what he said to me. The day he said it. And in that moment. When my mentor shared these words of Christ with me. And guys, this was in 1993 when this happened. What he said to me came after a word of encouragement. He said, he said Alan, I, I just see some things in your life, some, some natural gifts, if you will, some, maybe some abilities. And he just began to encourage me in that. As you look around the room today, somebody just might need to be encouraged in the gift that God's given to them. And guess what? God might use you today to speak that encouragement into their life. It means a lot. It can go a very long way. He was speaking things of encouragement to me and, and giftings. And, and then he said, and by the way, you do know that to whom much is given. Here's your text, Luke 12, 48. At the end, it's the very last part of what Jesus said in this particular teaching. New American Standard translates it, from everyone who has been given much, much will be what? 
from everyone who has been given much, much will be what? Much will be required. He quoted it to me like this. To whom much is given, much is required. This week, as I, I thought about us and our lives and our ministry, these words were coming to me. We've been blessed with so much. We've been blessed with a great tool. We've been blessed with great people. We've been blessed with great ministries. We are blessed. We are blessed. We are blessed with the greatest good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. You, we have been blessed with that. And the words, what do we do now? What do we do now? What do we do now? What's coming to me? To whom much is given, much is required. Now, over the years, as I thought about that, and I've asked myself, myself, did I live up to those expectations? And time and time again, the answer comes back, no, not even close. Of what he felt, I felt like he spoke into my life that day. I have felt I'm not even close. For whatever reason, I'm not even close to meeting that expectation. But over the years, it's been a driving force in my life. What this has done for me is it's forced me to go back to its context. Where, where did this come from? What was Jesus trying to communicate here when he said these words, to whom much is given, much will be what? Much will be required. So in going back to that original teaching of Christ. I find Jesus with his disciples. And Jesus has given a previous teaching on the second coming of Christ. And by the way, let me ask you today, how many comings of Christ has there, is there spoken of in Scripture? I'll put it that way. How many comings of Christ, physical, literal, we're not talking rapture, partial coming, but actually being on this planet. How many advents, if you will, comings of Christ the Scripture speak of? There's two. One that next Sunday we're going to kick off a, a celebration of His first coming. We call it the Advent season where Christ came to us for the very first time. Some of you need some encouragement about the second coming of Christ that's in the future. Hasn't happened yet, obviously. But when Scripture talks about the second coming of Christ, some people really struggle with that. And they're thinking, oh, gosh, oh my goodness, a second coming of Christ. Will it happen in my lifetime? Will it not? You know, how should I, how should I respond to this? Can I, can I really embrace and believe that He is literally going to come a second time. And we have said time and time again, if you need encouragement and a hope that He can come again the second time, then know today He came the first time. That the first coming of Christ is your foundation, your apologetic, if you will, of why you can believe and have faith that He will do it again. So we got to keep in mind coming into this text and into this teaching, that there are two comings of Christ. Here, he's probably preparing his, his disciples for the next coming that's going to happen. And he tells them that they need to be on watch. They need to be ready. Uh, they don't want to be caught by surprise in, in this. And so like in Luke chapter 12, uh, you don't have to look at this, but around verse 35... You know, he's kind of just giving them the, the prep work about watching and being aware. In verse 40, he says, You too be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour that you do not what? That you do not what? That you do not. He's coming at an hour that you do not expect. So when people start making predictions... And they say, I think Jesus is going to come here. Or Jesus, is, every time historically anyone's ever thrown out a prediction about when Jesus is going to come, they got egg on their face. But it's right here. He's going to come at a time that no one 
expects. But how many comings of Christ the Scripture speak of? One or two, one or two, one or two. The answer is two. And they were living in this moment during the first one. Now watch this. And I'm telling you, upon the initial reading of this passage, if this does not make the hair on the back of your neck stand up, then you're asleep. So why don't you just go ahead and nudge your neighbor right now, give him a little, quiet little nudge and say, listen to this. The words of Christ. We need to take this in today. So he says, actually Peter starts it in verse 41. And Peter said, Lord, are you addressing this parable to us? All that about being ready and watching. Or to everyone else as well. Not just us disciples. Everyone else around us. And then Jesus says. Who then is the faithful and sensible steward. Whom his master will put in charge of his servants. To give them their rations at the proper time. Blessed is that slave or servant, depending on your translation. Blessed is that servant whom his master finds so doing when he comes. So servant number one is the wise and faithful servant. Servant contestant number one. Wise, faithful servant. And when he does well, the scripture says he's blessed. The master finds favor with him. And in verse 44, truly, I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possession. Wise, faithful servant does well. More comes to him in order to be a steward over it. Then in verse 45, things begin to change. But. If that servant, if that slave says in his heart, my master will be a long time in coming and begins to beat the servants or the other slaves, both men and women, and to eat and drink and get drunk. Not a very good servant or steward here. Can I get an amen? Not doing a very good job at all. He gets kind of lazy. Says, you know what? Master's not going to come. So let's just live it up. Party it up. And let's just beat the snot out of the other folks around us. Who wants to join that church? Who wants to be a part of that scenario? Right? Not very good. So then verse 46. The master of that steward, that slave, will come on a day when he does not expect him and an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces. And the whole crowd goes, oh. And assign him a place with the unbelievers. And that slave. So that's contestant number two. Contestant number one is the one who was wise and faithful. Did what he's supposed to be doing. Was a good steward. Man, when the master comes, he's blessed. He's rewarded. Contestant number two. Servant number two. The master ain't coming. Let's party. Let's live it up. And become abusive to all the others. Master shows up, not a good end for that contestant number two. Verse 47. And that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will shall receive many lashes, lashes. 
A lash is a beating. These are not like eyelashes. These are a little beating, okay? Trying to make light here of a very serious text, actually. He will receive many lashes. But the one who did not know it, this is contestant number three. Contestant number three just doesn't have a clue. Look at your neighbor right now and just say, do you have a clue? Just, do you have a clue? Do you have a clue? Do you ever think some people just don't have a clue? Can I get an amen? Do you ever think some people just don't have a clue? Can I get an amen? This is a great time for audience participation. Do you ever feel in your life that some people just don't have a clue? All right, just let it out. Just let it go. This is therapy. Just let it go. So contestant number three really doesn't have a clue about what's going on. He did not know. This is verse 48. But the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging, a flogging is another word for a beating, a severe beating, will receive but few. But few what? Let's read that again. The one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few. But few blessing, but few reward. That's how you might read into that at this point. And we stop right there. And we look at this, and from a teaching standpoint, this is a parable. And many times when Jesus would teach a parable, he might have one central point. But not always. Jesus was a master storyteller. He was a master teacher. And it, it, it almost is, can be frustrating at times because this all starts off with a simple question from Peter. Okay, are you talking to us? Are you talking to me? Are you talking to me? Aren't y'all excited about the new Lion King coming out? Are you talking to me? Y'all have anybody have a clue what I'm talking about? Did y'all not see the preview to the new Lion King? Man, okay. Yeah, so he's like, you talking to me? You talking to everyone else? And it can be frustrating at times because Jesus doesn't give like this simple answer. Yeah, I'm talking to you. Or, yeah, I'm talking to you and everyone else. He just flies right into this parable. But this parable is really more like a puzzle. It's really like a puzzle. We're trying to put pieces together. And most people, most people would identify themselves as servants of Jesus. Maybe you identify yourself as a servant of Jesus. And many times when Jesus would talk about servants or followers, he would have two classes of people or two groups of people. He would talk about sheep and what? Sheep and goats. He would talk about wheat and what? Wheat and tares or wheat and weeds. Bad fish, good fish. And we typically look at these things. Oh, there's two groups of people. Which camp am I in today? But guess what? There's not two contestants. There's three contestants in this teaching of Jesus. And there were many times that Jesus would talk about multiple groups or multiple people. Uh, the parable of the sower. He talks about the different types of, of ground, right? So Jesus will at times talk about different groups of people, and it seems like that's what he's doing here because you've got three stewards or servants, and most people would identify themselves as a follower of Jesus, and they're thinking, oh my goodness. I better get busy. I better get to work. I better be faithful and watching. I want to be that wise steward. And they start bringing performance into their walk with Jesus. Am I doing enough? Will I ever do enough? I want to be ready. 
because I do not want to be the one. And doesn't even begin to, to teach here that my goodness, if I'm not a faithful and good servant and steward, is Jesus, oh my goodness, is He going to find me and then cut me into pieces? You see, this is a good reason why we need people working with children during the service. Because we're going to talk about stuff. And some of the stuff we talk about is really on an adult conversational level. That's why we need people working with kids in service. So we can be real about some of these things. And by the way, I hate to burst your bubble, but the Bible is not ready G. It's not G rated. So if I'm not faithful, when Jesus finds me, is he going to cut me into pieces and cast me into hell with the unbelievers? And folks, that's how this has been taught to not instill hope into believers about the second coming of Christ, but to instill fear into their hearts and lives. And guess what? That particular approach is not compatible with grace. Because Jesus never beat anyone. And if you've ever come to a place in your life and you thought God wanted to beat you, then look to Jesus. Because Jesus never beat anyone. And even in instances where there was a remote possibility that someone could have been beaten, like the woman who was caught in, in adultery, remember that? And they could have stoned her. Jesus stepped to her defense. And what did He say? He said, you who are without sin... Cast the first what? Cast the first stone. And they all walked away. You come to this third person in this story, and this person just didn't have a clue. And because they didn't have a clue, it doesn't seem like what happens to them as, is nearly as bad because they didn't know. And some people have taken this part of Scripture and they've said, well, for those who just don't know, those who are just not ignorant, those who maybe have a little bit of Jesus, but they don't know a whole lot about Jesus, then He's going to take it easy on them. And man, when you start factoring this into the cross and you start factoring this into grace, you can see why people get confused or perplexed and they live with fear and not hope I've told you many times about the only time the only time my grandfather ever really got on to me I'll never forget it but I never questioned his love for me or his grace for me and the one you run to when life is hard is the one who has shown compassion and goodness and mercy. And this is why Paul later says in Romans, do you not know? Just say this with me. Do you not know? Do you not know? Say that with me. Do you not know? Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, do you not know? Do you not know? Do you not know? Do you not know? Romans. It's do you not know? 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 Do you not know that it is not the judgment of God that leads to repentance, but it is the goodness of God that leads to repentance? Look it up, Romans 2. It is the goodness of God that leads to repentance. And if you are in Christ today, judgment has already passed. 
You don't have to live your life in fear that the hammer is going to fall because the hammer already fell on Jesus. And he took all your stuff. He took it all. He was beaten for you. And this puzzle comes together in verse 48. And we're going to go more into this next Sunday and teach even more on this teaching of Christ. But this is the clue here. And then what you do at this point is you begin to factor in these words of Christ, not just in regards to the second coming, the coming that hasn't happened yet, but the coming that already had happened. And he was speaking to an audience of people that were with him at that moment, not just those who followed him and believed, but also the Jews and the Pharisees and those who they themselves were not ready when he came the first time. And they had not been good stewards the first time. And when Jesus came and cut them to pieces, he didn't do it with a sword. He did it with the word of God. And he did it with truth. He cut through all of their law bearing business of beating people down with empty religion. And he cut them into pieces, not with a sword, but with the truth. And you start going, wow. Now, this is starting to make sense. And what brings it together, these last words. Are y'all ready? And from everyone, go back to the text. Here's your clue. And from everyone who has been given much, shall much be required. And to whom they entrusted much of him, they will ask all the more. Modern day, 21st century, if you, if you have accepted Christ as Savior, and you're not like that religious group he's picking through right now, but you've accepted Christ as Savior and Lord of your life. You have received much. And you ask the question, what is that much? He says much will be required. Not much in a, oh, not much in a different way. Sorry, I'm getting a little splatter. We need umbrellas on the first row. Not much in the sense of something different. Like, okay, You've been given much, now you go do this and you go do this. Church, you've been given this great building, now you need to go out and serve the community. And folks, people have raked us over the coals. Because we've been blessed. And my heart is this. Let's now take what we've been blessed with and give it away for the glory of Jesus. Can, can we do that? Are you ready to do that? Are you ready to give it away for the glory of Jesus? To the hurt and the broken, the needy, the oppressed, the poor. But the much that you've been given is the much that is required. And what is the much? The much has a name. And his name is Jesus. Read it like this. To those who have been given Jesus... Jesus is required. What could we give to this community? What can we give to this world in need? The only much that will ever meet their need is the same much that's ever met your need. And the much has a name and the name is Jesus. We will not give them empty religion. We will not browbeat them. But we will preach a pure gospel of grace. Repent of your sin. Accept Jesus as Lord and Savior and be made new. This is your fresh start. And it starts with turning a heart that says Jesus is good and I will turn and I will accept the gift He's given to me. The much is required is the same much that's been given and the much is Jesus. And I can breathe knowing that. So as we stand together this morning.